My name is Lori Power. My company is MP Benefits, and I'm a group benefit consultant. Each week, I like to have dynamic conversations with people who are in the know that yeah. we grow and learn and evolve through strategic conversation. And as we muddle through all of the constant shifting motions that we have all over the place, it's important to stay up to date on what is available out there. So I'm really pleased today that Dave Campbell from People Corp has decided to join me and we talk about all things group retirement. Can you take a moment, Dave, and introduce yourself? I'd be happy to. So uh, thank you very much for the introduction, Laurie. Uh, as, as Laurie mentioned, I am at uh, People Corporation as a uh, GRS consultant. Uh, I do a lot of work in with small businesses, not-for-profits, entrepreneurs, nonprofits, that sort of thing. Uh, my background previous to People Corps is I was at Manulife uh, in a member GRS member engagement role. So I've kind of got that experience of the of the consulting side, and then also, of course, quite a bit of experience with the with a large carrier as well. Uh, when I was with at Manulife, I was working with very large clients, uh, some of our largest here in Western or of theirs in Western Canada, no longer mine, of course. Uh, and uh, I actually came to, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, this the GRS game a little bit later than, than most people. I've been doing this for about 10 years. Uh, you can tell by the hairline that I'm not 10 years out of university. So uh, between between uh, university and GRS, I was uh, I was working overseas actually, starting off as an English teacher, ended up going to school over there, and actually working in uh, learning and development for one of the big for accounting form, firms when I was over there. So I was there for quite a while, about 15 years, uh, all told. And that's sort of kind of how I got um, input, sort of moving towards the direction of GRS because when I was living overseas, I was doing a lot of work uh, by contract, uh, maybe a little bit under the table as well. Uh, and obviously there is not sort of any kind of structured retirement savings plan when, when you're doing that kind of work. So uh, even sort of within my, uh, probably earlier than most was was thinking about if this is if I was going to be staying in Asia, what kind of things would I be doing to you know make sure that I had some sort of nest egg uh, down the road? So that's when I started looking into things like uh, investing, you know, really just sort of basic stuff like index funds, this sort of thing, um, real estate trust, that kind of thing. So that's really sort of how I got into it. Uh, when I was living overseas, Manulife was one of the a uh, few Canadian companies that had sort of a significant presence in greater China. So I had uh, put my sort of, you know, put the, the job alert on thinking that at some point when I was over there, I'd get a job at Manulife. Things happen, you have kids, you end up coming back to Canada and then uh, GR, a GRS role came up, uh, the one that I was previously in, uh, that came up right after we moved back to Canada. So uh, that's that's sort of the, the path of how I, uh, I got into retirement. So, even before I was in retirement, I was, uh, I was, it was something I was working on and that's a good thing. And, uh, and here I find myself today. So. Well, we're going to talk about the spare child effect, but I think it's, it's difficult. We can get, uh, you know, when we look at group retirement savings programs and the many advantages of putting it through under an employer uh, platform, we still have, even if we get employers on board with putting in that group retirement, on how they will communicate that to their employees and show that value and get people engaged enough to participate. But I don't want to get ahead of myself. So we were going to talk first about the spare child effect. Right. So uh, I call, I don't, I, I don't know how many others refer to it this way, but you know, you've got this idea of the heir and the spare and uh uh, our former Royal just came out with his book as the spare, but I often think of group retirement as sort of the, the if it's the heir and the spare, if, if benefits are the heir and the spare, then group retirement is the spare. And what I mean by that is uh, that health and dental, that's usually, you know, that's that's been more established within uh, employers for quite some time. There's still a lot of employers out there who don't have GRS programs set up. Uh, and there's a number of reasons for that, which I'm sure we'll get into. Uh, but that's sort of why I think of as, as group retirement as being the spare. As a result, there's a, you know, because it doesn't get quite as much focus as that health and dental uh, and, and group insurance, then uh, it's, there's a, there's a uh, much smaller knowledge base just within all industries about how they work and this sort of thing. 
that's great for me because it means that I, I've definitely got a role to a part to play in all of this and, and, uh, and, and not just sort of, um, you know, we certainly don't see ourselves as gatekeepers of this information. We're, we're very willing to share and, and help uh, both employers, consultants, whomever, uh, advisors uh, learn more about GRS and the things they should be looking for and asking for. Uh, I don't like telling people that it's not particularly difficult because that undermines uh, what I'm trying to do, but it is not. Once you sort of get the hang of it, there's, uh, there's, there's not too much to it. One of the great things about retirement too, as opposed to that health and dental side is group retirement programs are much stickier. They don't move around very much. Um, you know, what typically we would like to see them sort of evaluated uh, from a marketing perspective, once every five years. And even within that, most most times employers aren't looking to move those plans. Uh, so really what you end up having is, uh, you know, there'll be a couple of touch points a year. There'll be a plan review to from from the uh, from whoever is carrying the program to the employer, just so that uh, everybody, you know, knows that the program's being run effectively, consistently, this sort of thing. Uh, but other than that, they they really just sort of maintain themselves. Members get a statement every year to let them know how much money they've made. Uh, or as a case with last year, how much money they may have lost. Uh, and, uh, and then everything uh, runs smoothly from there. So let's help build the story, Dave. Like, what kind of, what are, if in your opinion, what are the top three, maybe five reasons why an employer should even consider? So let's move it out of the spare and move it yeah. into a priority category and say, what are the top five reasons? that an employer should consider putting in a group retirement plan other than saying, okay, I'm going to give you X amount of dollars a year. You go find your own plan. Go get your own investor. Uh, very good question. So I think first and foremost, um, people in employees in Canada are looking to their employers uh, for uh, support in areas of financial wellness. Obviously retirement's a big part of that. Uh, retirement tends to be that thing that we try not to think about uh, and but of course knowing full well that it's something that it needs to be planned for uh, and in addition to just not just a retirement program but employees are employees and prospective employees are looking to their employers uh, to also provide support in areas of financial wellness uh, so this can be things of course like uh, budgets or debt management emergency funds all this kind of stuff it's all wrapped up and to me it makes a lot of sense uh, this is where your money's coming from your employer uh, and, and so it's a great place to, for those people to be tying those two pieces together and money's coming in and what are you doing with it uh, to, to better your life. So I think that's probably the, the main piece. And I think what I'm hearing more and more often, especially from employers who are coming to me looking for programs, is uh, I need a program because either A, when they're, hire, when, they're, when they're doing their interviews, people are asking more often about, well, what do you guys have for retirement program or pension or this sort of thing? Uh, or B, they, they're seeing that their competitors are putting these programs in, and that's obviously a hiring differentiation for, for their competitors as well. So uh, as much as they're competing for jobs or bids or this sort of thing, they're competing for labor. And, and there's, uh, it's, it's great for me that, uh, that there's more competition out there uh, for these programs and, and those employees. So. And I think in adding to the tax viability or the tax advantage of being able to put something like this in place where the employee gets the uh, deduction on their tax, on their personal taxes, the employer gets the corporate tax deduction, but it adds to, I write a lot about this, this hire to retire, right? If you're going to build your workplace culture and you're going to want to to attract and actually retain somebody who thinks of you as an employer that they could retire with, what better as a frontline product to have to say, yes, we offer benefits and primarily we want you to stick around because we have a great group RSP. We have a great retirement program that is going to invest in you. Very much so. Yeah, I would definitely agree with that. And, uh, Again, you don't, it's, it's one of those things, particularly with younger workers that they're not thinking about. Uh, and unless it's sort of front and center of them and them that they're unlikely to think about it. So, uh, you know, having those conversations as part of the onboarding about what retirement is and the, the solutions and services that are available to them as, as group plan members uh, is definitely a, a lot of value in there. 
what kind of financial commitment are are employers looking at when they're when they're considering putting a program in place? Like it's fine to say, you know, I'm going to have a two, three, four, five, whatever percent matching program. And then you're going to try to get people to to come on board, your employees to come on board. But there are minimums that you must have in order to establish a group RSP in place. Yes, that's right. And and it's a very it's been a very it is a very interesting time, particularly with small businesses right now. Um, we sort of um, there's kind of three areas that a small business can look to start a group retirement program. Uh, there's the traditional insurance carriers, so the Manulife, Sun Life, Canada Life, IA, Desjardins. Uh, you can uh, quite often businesses will set up group RSPs through their banks, uh, RBC, TD, etc. Uh, and then what is also very interesting about what's happening now is we're starting to see some online carriers. So completely digital products where we're not talking about a brick and mortar insurance corporation. Uh, we're talking about, again, like I said, completely online, everything digital. Those are starting to come online as well. With respect to those minimums, uh, when we look at the larger carriers, uh, and again, as I mentioned, this is an area that I've done quite a bit of work in. Um, there's, it's usually about $10,000 annual cash flow that need to go in on a startup. Uh, so that would be the, the, the minimum. Uh, and then within that, you're going to get variations among those carriers about what kind of fees you're paying. Uh, the variance on the services offered are not quite as much, but there's a little bit of variance there as well. And, uh, and, and so that's obviously one way, but again, it's that $10,000 barrier mark that, uh, that can really that can sort of cut out a lot of those small businesses, uh, and so what end, may end up happening is they'll end up going over to the to their bank uh, and set up uh, set up the group RSP through their bank. Uh, we are not in our position as People Core and Consultant is that we are not we don't see the bank as being a good product for con, for customers, um, particularly because there's a lot of fees associated with them. You essentially be paying the same fees as if you set up your own individual program. Whereas the advantage of a group program is that you would be paying lower fees uh, due to that bulk purchasing, right? <clears throat> so that's what we should we feel you should be getting. Um, now with those online carriers, they're starting to fill out. Uh, that's an opportunity that we're exploring to fill out that uh, area under that 10,000 K. So you're getting a lot of what you would see from the insurance carrier, the lower fees, uh, but obviously not having to reach that minimum. There's some limitations with those online carriers as well. So um, you know it's it's really my job is always about you know making sure that i'm having the conversation with the customer about what they're trying to achieve not necessarily pushing one product over another but obviously having the, the the depth of knowledge to be able to recommend things or or things different options that an employer could consider but uh so it's really about what does the employer want and then trying to find the, the best solution for for that employer as far as the disruptors i'll call them the online platforms um hmm. One of the, you kind of alluded to it already, um, where their their minimums might be less, if not if not none, right? Like there, in some cases, there isn't any minimums. Are you? My experience with the small group is primarily where I work in, you know, under yeah. fifty lives even. Um, I've I found that a lot of employers haven't had a lot of uptake in the RSP programs that they've put in place, even with the matching contributions. And it it often you know the the, the relationship becomes um, uh, with the with the insurer um, it, it becomes strained because then they're saying well you have to meet these minimums you have to pay this fee and mm -hmm. and, and the 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 companies don't recognize that that fee is there they don't understand why it's there they don't like it right, right. Um, so I guess you're exploring those right now are you able to shed a little light on some of the things that you're looking for because let's face it one of my one one of my big concerns is we just the recent banking upheaval that's going on uh, yeah that brings a big concern for these new to market items uh so the concern being just sort of a general mistrust of financial institutions or well a mistrust and just like if we're advising clients on those is it going to um it, like what what kind of risks are associated with that i guess um I, my question really isn't that clear it's more of a dialogue yeah no that's it, that's fine and there's a there's a couple of things i think we can touch on within that one is um 
you know, the challenges of getting people um, to be contributing despite the fact that there's that match on the table. I feel that one of the areas that those traditional carriers fall short on is the employee education. Uh, a lot of those smaller programs, they're not offering specific, you know, if they are offering specific education for the employees about enrollment or this sort of thing, it tends to be sort of very bulk or, or this kind of thing, not specific to that organization and falls a little bit short, especially, I mean, it's a great message for employers to their employees to say, hey, listen, if you invest in this R RSP because of the match, you're basically, that's 100% return on, on your investment right before you start, before, right? But there's not enough, there's not enough attention paid to educating those employees off the off the start, and not just about the program and the match, but you know there's a wealth of tools within those. Um, I mean, we they the carriers will talk a big game about the financial wellness and et cetera, but if you if you're somebody who doesn't have a background with the with the website or you're obviously new to the website because you're a new plan member, you don't necessarily know where to find these things and 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 really uh, you know so it's. I, I, again, circling back, I do think that there's a, an opportunity there for more education for the employees, um, which is, of course, one of the things that, that we make sure that uh, that is happening. Um, we're very, we're very careful about uh, following up on those plans that are not seeing contributions and making sure that, uh, uh, you know, if they're encountering challenges that we're that we've got support available for them to to get those people in. So. It's it, it, I, I, the education side is so, so important. But when you talk about the online opportunities for those that are, want to be under that 10,000, it devalues the education component that is necessary to get the buy-in, get the employee buy-in, because there's not going to be any opportunity for an education segment if all you're doing is the same as you do for online banking you're picking your point and and pick and one of the ongoing issues that we come across is information from google it takes up a significant portion of that education time to give them the realities of what they're what they're being offered so i like like the idea, I think that we do need a commitment that if we're to get get it out of the spare child realm, which you say, um, and move it into a mainstream benefit option to accommodate and, and work alongside with compensation and culture and hiring to retire, then we need to be able to also say that there's a cost of offering this and there's a priority on education. Uh, that leads me into the plan designs. One of my favorite ways to do a plan design is to have a deferred profit sharing from the employer's side of things and the group RSP on the employee side of things. What what are your most common takes on building out that plan design? Uh, that's within our team, our GRS team here, here at People Court. That's our advised approach is the RRSP with the DPSP, uh, particularly for those types of industries that see high turnover. Those DPSPs are very comforting to the employer knowing that they've got that two-year vesting. They can put that up to two-year vesting component on it uh, so that if they... Uh, if they do see someone take off, they're not watching their money walk out the door with them. And if the person, the employee, does stick around for that for that period, then uh, then they're rewarded with uh, with with those uh, with those contributions. Uh, yeah, definitely. RSP DPSP is uh, is is our advised approach, as I mentioned. Typically, though, what we're seeing is is just the straight RRSP. Um, I think I'm 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 making assumptions here as I say this. I haven't dug too deeply into it, but I think one of the things that attracts employers to the RRSP only is because it's just it's a much sort of simpler message. And this again comes back to the the whole idea of education, right? Uh, it's a lot easier, I think, for them to <clears throat> explain to their employees that they're setting up a matching RRSP uh, and feel comfortable talking about what an RRSP is, just from you know from all of our own experiences, we're we're familiar with what they are, rather than having to jump into the DPSP and explain how that works and et cetera. So. Um, so yeah, we're very much in favor of the RSP DPSP. It's a great uh, position for for us to um, to be able to offer that to employees or to offer to help them get that. Uh, and of course, there's also the TFSAs as well. So, um, so quite often we'll see either RSP with the TFSA add-on or that RSP DPSP with the TFSA. Uh, obviously, with the TFSA being uh, strictly employee voluntary contributions. 
you can put them with matches, but typically what we're seeing is, is just as a voluntary plan. So uh, again, so members, rather than having an individual TFSA at a retail institution where you're paying two and a quarter or 2.5, uh, you're paying the lower fees that you would see in a group program for the for the TFSA that's set up through the employer. Again, though, education, right? Uh, lots of times those TFSAs are set up for the employers and you think it's going to it's a great deal for the employees. Uh, but um, you're not seeing a lot of growth in them because it's not the the story is not being told to those employees about why they why they should be having their money in the group TFSA rather than the individual one. So should they have one? And when, when you're building that story, Dave, what's that story sound like? The, the standard thing is, I mean, everything, so much of the story that we tell when we're promoting plans or selling plans is about the fees, right? Um, so we use a lot of graphs and this sort of thing saying, hey, if you've got something at a retail institution, this is what your growth looks like over 30 years based on X, Y, Z assumptions. What's in there? What are you putting in each year? Uh, this is what you would be getting if you would move that money from, a, say, an individual TFSA to a group TFSA. You're looking at, you know, forty, fifty, hundred thousand dollars, depending on sort of what kind of an audience you're speaking to. Uh, so really, you know, it's the side by side uh, curving graphs of of growth uh, over over thirty years, and, and letting them see that big difference there that that uh, that just that less than a percent in in fees difference can make. So that's really the the, the key selling point of it there. Uh, I think a lot of it too, I mean, you, you can sort of drill down on it from there, what tends to sort of be the, um, the next questions is people will say, well, at my bank, the, uh, the uh, MERs on the ETFs that I'm buying, they're, they're very comparable to what you're paying and or what we're seeing with this group plan. Then you say, well, you're probably also paying a fee on the on, based on the amount that you have in your account as well. If you looked into that, because that's typically going to push you higher than you, what you'd see in a group program. The other question they'll be asking too is, well, tell me about the uh, the performance of the of the funds that are available within this plan. Uh, so that's another uh, sort of drill down talking point is uh, you know that you kind of be got to be on your toes for have that information readily available for them so that they can see that there's decent growth through those funds. Uh, particular, particularly as you're, uh, if you're using the plan as intended, which is that long-term steady investment uh, and not, uh, you know, not day trading with it, right? So right off the top there, when we think about doing, showing the graphs that are 30 years out, and we know the realities of employees coming and going from one employer to the other, do you think it's wise to perhaps shorten those graphs to perhaps a five or 10 year so that they can buy into imagining I'm going to be with this employer for the next five years, the next 10 years. Whereas if you look 30 years out, it might be, it's like looking at a novel that's 4,000 yeah. pages versus a novel that's 250. And I go, oh yeah, I can get through that one. Not yeah. quite sure I have the breadth of time for that one. And you know, Lori, I've never actually thought about doing it that way. I think, uh, you know, like all of us, I might get a little set in my ways from time to time. So I, I appreciate that. Um, I think because part of the story too is um, you, like you're not just, from, from my perspective, you're not just selling that your employer is providing an RRSP. It's that you are participating in an RRSP. And regardless of what of, of where you are with your employer, if you're here for five years, 10 years, 15, what have you, you will always have that RRSP in some way, shape or form. Uh, you can take it with you to the next employer, you can set up your individual plan, et cetera, et cetera. So um, yeah, I will take that under advisement though and, and think about that for the future. The, I'm just thinking on how, how we help build that narrative to attract mm -hmm. those employees into participation because I, I agree with you. I think the number one barrier isn't so much of getting employers on board to offer a group RSP. It's them trying to attract their employees to actually participate. Mm -hmm. Take me through some of the governance that employers should be aware of when they put in a, a deferred profit sharing group RSP TFSA combo. Sure, sure. Well, I, with any group plan, I mean, it's an, it's employer sponsored right in the name, right? So there is a fiduciary responsibility to them. This is one of the things that, you know, when we, uh, when we uh, speak down about the bank offerings is, um, is, is there's not as much governance as you would see with a carrier setup, of course. 
Uh, it's essentially just a collection of individual RRSPs, for example, that they that they're calling group. Uh, so there's no uh, there's no aggregate reporting on the performance of the plan or the money that's in it or this sort of thing. Uh, they do get a plan review, but uh, there's just not um, there's not quite as much of that due diligence uh, that that's being um, that's being presented. Um, with governance, we're looking at things like. Can, is, is the administration consistent? Are they using the proper and efficient practices? Are there clear lines of accountability for who's responsible for one for what? Obviously, you've got that regular performance evaluation in there. Uh, and, uh, and there is the opportunity within these group plans for disgruntled plan members to down the road uh, attempt litigation. And, and what this governance structure does is um, it's, it's, I think many feel that it's very much a box checking exercise but it is an important one in that down the road, if somebody comes along and says, hey, you guys you know, weren't doing X, Y, and Z, at least there's, there's, those don't go very far because there's been a lot of different eyes on this plan over the years, year by year plan review saying, okay, this is what's happening. This is what we like. Uh, this might be an area of concern. We'll keep our eye on. Here's an opportunity for education so that there's that uh, engagement for all parties, if it's the, through the employer, the carrier, uh, if there's a consultant like myself involved, you know, you've got all these eyes on it, looking for different things and making sure that the plan's being run, uh, not just according to the standards and guidelines that it should be, but is it also being run to meet the objectives of the employer, if they were the original objectives when it was being set up, or if they've changed what they want to do with it, that all has to be reflected and, and should be discussed on a, on a regular basis. So I'm going to reach out on this one. So uh, this is from an advisor's perspective, and, and I just had a conversation about GRS for, for a small group. And um, so the, the big concern, I would say, for a lot of advisors that, that might be in group benefits is just, and I'll speak from personal experience, I haven't had a lot of experience with GRS. I've had some, but not a lot. Yeah. So, you know, one of the, one of my, I'm, all, I'm a risk adverse type person great fit for insurance, insurance business, but I don't, I don't like doing things that I don't understand the risk yeah. to, right? And so I want to make sure that I have those checks and balances in place and workflows and processes to be able to make sure I'm doing the right thing for the client, right? Mm -hmm. And I guess, so how does an advisor go about getting that, that knowledge or those processes and workflows in place when, when they aren't, when they're just trying to get into that end of the business? Um, at the risk of uh, self-promoting too much, I mean, that's a lot of what I do uh, is work with advisors who are not as familiar with the GRS space. Um, like I said off the top, Corey, it's not particularly complicated. I think uh, in my experience, the barrier to more advisors getting into it is thinking that it's, it's going to be a little bit more complicated than it actually is. Um, so oftentimes what we do is we'll just sort of start working on some cases together, uh, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's pretty quickly apparent that it's not, uh, of, of what needs to be done and this sort of thing and the things to look out for, especially when dealing with the carriers, that kind of thing. Um, in my experience, the, there's, uh, I mean, obviously with insurance companies, there's a lot of risk aversion. They've got, they've got themselves covered off six ways of Sundays. Uh, they've got uh, the employers covered off. Uh, it's I, I find it to be an extremely safe uh, environment as far as, far as that as doing business. So um, it's uh, yeah. I mean, I hope I, I hope I've answered your question. But uh, I would yeah. I, mean, I, I was, would I'll, you I'll to, redirect a bit on this if that's okay. Um, sure, so of course. Really, really, it's about workflow, right? Like yeah. if this, then that. If not that, then this. Right. That's kind of where my my mind goes and. And just making sure that, you know, uh, um, there's certain things that need to be done for service year over year over year. And it needs to be a repeatable process so that it's not easily forgotten. Right. <laughs> that's, that's how my brain works. <laughs> anyway, yeah. um, my goal would be is, is number one, to be able to answer those, to, to be able to provide that service workflow. So it's, it's predictable and, 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 and repeatable, but then also... Um, making sure that um, in the process of all that, I'm able to answer questions and provide advice appropriate to that to that client's needs. But that that all, I'm kind of speaking 
with third party information in my brain right now, but yeah. um, I'm, I'm just trying to put it together. So ultimately it's just the workflows where I'm trying to get an understanding. Of. Yeah. Um, it's a very, it's a, it's kind of a tricky question. And we could take it offline later too. Yeah, for sure. I mean, just because I've like, I've been obviously living in this and immersed in this for the past decade. And it's, you know, it's, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's much easier sort of specific examples of where you're running into issues. I think I can probably address with as far as an overarching theme. Uh, I, I don't know if I can offer sort of too much of value uh, at this time. I see it as a partnership chain. So, you know, the who, wherever you're placing that group RSP, whether it's with the insurer, or with its, uh, you know, through People Corp or any of the others, you know, you go into partnership with them, which then creates a partnership with the employer, which then creates that partnership with the employee. And I think that communication goes back and forth. So when, when questions are asked, from the employee level, it should come back and go and, and continue just like a, a flowing river, mm -hmm. because unless you're getting into, and I'll, I'll think about this in, in, in a different sense, Corey, when you're getting into employees who then want to do more financial planning and more individual, I think that's where it becomes complicated. And there we have the opportunity to, to build uh, centers of influence with people who are going to do that actual per personal financial plan. But if we keep it sticky to what we're doing with the employer and keep that communication flow going, I think we, we can do the job. Am I overstepping the bounds there, Dave, in that particular no, answer? No, I, I, that was an excellent answer to uh, a question I was unable to answer. So I appreciate, uh, appreciate that perspective and very much agree. It's, it's not these these relationships should have never within GRS should have never at no point be adversarial in any way it's you know everyone is working towards the same thing and that's uh that's obviously well I guess two things meeting the objectives of the employer which of course includes their budget uh but in the end it's about the plan members right and making sure that they've got the resources that they need uh not just for that financial uh freedom for retirement but also to make sure that they're living financially sound lives today uh, and not suffering any of those adverse impacts that come from financial stress, right? I'll share one more thing that I, you know, it, I, I love learning and I, I think I'm always learning and uh, I love especially learning from, from clients. So consider this when you're putting in a group RSP and this was a, a new learning for me is we have a lot of employers, especially here in Alberta, that bring in foreign workers. And when you're bringing in foreign workers and they're offering a group RSP, do remember to have an accountant nearby because they cannot contribute. They can contribute, but they cannot have the tax relief until they have filed their taxes and have contribution room. We went around and around the circles on that, on you talk about communication, it was going, but it was reaching a brick wall. We have a group RSP, just participate. And then the the uh, we had some foreign workers say, but I don't know about this tax thing. And so we brought in, we had an opportunity to bring in an accountant who said, yes, you can contribute, but no, you don't have contribution room for for the tax advantage until you have filed your first taxes. So I wanted to, to share that out because I, I love constantly learning about these things. Thanks so much, Dave, for coming in. This is always the fastest half hour of my week. It was great conversation. I hope I can invite you back in because I really feel sure. that we've only reached the tip of the iceberg in, in a great conversation. I hope that uh, you liked it and that you'll come back again and have a great rest of your week.